Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Robert Barrow, Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford and the Paul M. Warburg Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Robert, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks. Great to be here again. Now, I know you're currently working on disasters. Um, and in the course of talking about disasters, which is our main topic, I hope we end up talking about some of the macro issues of the data. I don't mean to scare any of our listeners, but uh, they, they might be related. So let's just start with disasters uh, generally. Tell us what you mean by disasters and how you're studying them. I'm taking a macroeconomic perspective. So the main event from the U.S. history is the Great Depression of the early 1930s, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with to some degree. But I'm taking a broader perspective on that, looking across uh, many countries and the long history. Biggest macroeconomic disasters in this history going into the 19th century is the world wars. Uh, world War II is really the largest. World War I is also very pronounced. Uh, the United States is unusual because it wasn't affected negatively uh, from an economic standpoint by those events, but that's a, not the usual pattern if you look, uh, for example, across European or, or Asian uh, countries. They were disastrously affected by, by the world wars, you're saying? Well, World War II is, is the biggest uh, negative event. Uh, many countries had declines in gross domestic product and consumption by uh, 50% or more. Uh, that would include places like Germany, France, uh, Japan, uh, other countries in Western Europe, uh, Russia also, but the data are not so accurate for Russia, but I'm sure it fits in with that uh, pattern. They, all those nations you mentioned had, in addition to significantly larger uh, death rates as a function of population than the United States. They also had significant capital uh, destruction on their own soil, correct? Yeah, the destruction on the own soil is, is a key part of it. Uh, it varies across the countries about the uh, uh, mortality rate. Uh, France is not nearly so large as, uh, for example, Russia and Germany during uh, World War II. Uh, so we're not looking per se at the, at the death rates, although that would be a part of the story. We're looking more at the declines in economic activity gauged by production, which is gross domestic product, and by some measure uh, of consumption. Now, just in passing, I think it would be useful to talk about uh, a view that I think is incorrect, but is, I think, widely believed by, by some people and, uh, and uh, even being talked about today, that it's an advantage to have your factories and capital stock destroyed, because then you can rebuild with the latest technology. So in this viewpoint, the German and Japanese economic miracles of the uh, post-war period, after those significant declines you mentioned, were the fact that they could start from scratch and get new stuff. Is there anything to that, that argument? I think there's something to it to the extent that there is evidence of uh, recoveries uh, after major disasters. There tend to be periods where you grow at an above normal rate. Um, and particularly that's true to the extent that you mostly have uh, physical capital being destroyed, like factories. Uh, that's relatively easy to uh, replace. You can do it pretty uh, rapidly. But on net, it's a very negative experience uh, when you have half of your uh, national product destroyed and when consumption levels decline, the effect tends to persist for a long time in a negative way. I wouldn't recommend it as a way to reform society or improve <laughs> institutions, either, even though there are some offsetting effects of that type. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, we, let's talk about that death, uh, the death rate for a minute. And uh, you and I chatted informally about this uh, a few days ago. Uh, the loss of physical capital is very easy to see. Uh, death is easy to see, but the loss of human capital, the knowledge and potential for innovation that's lost uh, when there's an abnormal death rate due to war, one would think that would have a negative impact on economic growth. And not just in the countries that, that sustained it, but, but the countries that would have benefited from the, 
from those innovations. And people, I think, mistakenly believe that it's good to have innovators come from one's own country, which I don't think has really any truth to it. Um, surely there is a, a, a terrible toll, not just in, in human suffering, but in creativity when, when so many people are killed. Well, to some extent, uh, reduced numbers of people, human capital in that form is like reducing uh, physical capital, machinery and such. I don't think there's really much evidence that just having twice as many people around really contributes to economic growth per person. Uh, theoretically, you could get effects of that uh, sort, but I don't think there's really much evidence that it actually works that way. So I wouldn't stress from an economic standpoint, uh, the biggest effects coming just through the scale of the population and that suffering through uh, mortality. I'm not, I'm not saying mortality is pleasant. Uh, I understand. Of course not. But I wouldn't have put that uh, up there as the number one thing. In fact, one of the thoughts is that the ideas people have accumulated and the technology uh, is not destroyed by uh, war. And that's partly why you can recover pretty rapidly is that the ideas that have already been accumulated are still there. And, you just have to exploit them by uh, rebuilding. So I think that's part of why you get uh, recoveries that are uh, above normal rates. Uh, the one case we think we're finding uh, where there's a more health-related uh, mortality uh, element as the key part of the disaster is the great influenza epidemic, uh, 1918 to 1920s, uh, are the main years. And we think that that does show up as a kind of health mortality shock per se. Uh, the only one we've really found that seems to be large enough from a macroeconomic standpoint to fit in with our list of these major uh, macro type crises. So the influenza epidemic of the late uh, 19 teens and the early part of the 20th century had a discernible macroeconomic impact. We think so. This is still partly a conjecture. Uh, you have to separate it from the effect of World War I because the flu uh, took place uh, toward the end of the war, and no doubt the transmission of the flu was uh, facilitated by war-related troop movements and other kinds of uh, transport. Uh, but we think we're going to be able to separate that as a macroeconomic disaster from the war per se, and we're currently working on that. So this, this is conjecture. Uh, the United States, for example, does have a major recession with a bottom in 1921, uh, it's a decline by about 15% in the gross domestic product and consumption, which is a very big event, Significant, uh, particularly from a U.S. perspective. And we think that that's the source of it, but we're, uh, we're studying that now. We're not sure about that. So this is like the World Cup effect. There's this claim that, which I find also kind of bizarre, that when an event like the World Cup comes along, or even the World Series, um, People stop working, they take more leisure, uh, and so somehow um, they don't make it up elsewhere. It's the part that's strange about this theory, that, that somehow it's, it's all an extra amount of leisure. But, but presumably with the influenza, there, there was an enormous number of people who had to do something other than productive work, taking care of sick people and keeping an eye on them. Is that part of the story, you think? Or is it just a sudden... It could be, but the mortality numbers are staggering. I mean, there are estimates of you know more than 40 million people worldwide being killed by this flu. This is not the usual flu, uh, partly in terms of deaths, but also that it uh, affected particularly people in the prime uh, age years, yeah. not so much uh, older and uh, the youngest people, which is a typical pattern of who is seriously affected by influenza. Uh, it also severely curtailed uh, transportation because, of course, people were trying to avoid the spread of the disease, but that must have had a big uh, secondary economic impact. Um, so we're, we're currently raising a lot of the, uh, the data uh, for this. We're, we're, we're searching for that. We're trying to see if there's a pattern where the countries that are most affected by the flu in terms of incidence and mortality were also the ones that suffered most in terms of macroeconomic data. And this is an ongoing part of our research project. We're not sure of the answers on this one. This is joint work with? I'm doing this work with a person who just finished his third year in the PhD economics program at Harvard. This is uh, Jose Ursua, who's uh, from Mexico, and he's been working with me. Uh, part of this project has been collecting vast amounts of long-term macroeconomic data. Uh, we're now working with uh, roughly 40 countries where we have the data. Uh, about a century or more, uh, in many cases going back to 1869 or, or even earlier. What do you think the quality of those data are? 
you know, it varies a lot across countries. Of course, we're focusing on the ones where the quality seems to be sufficient to get this kind of long-term information. And we think in terms of the broad macroeconomic patterns, the data are adequate, but uh, it varies a lot across countries as to uh, how well you can pin down the exact uh, magnitudes. But uh, we think we're going to have, uh, uh, we have currently 36 countries where we have the long-term data on gross domestic product. And we have a smaller number, about two dozen, where we're also able to separately estimate the consumption levels, which is conceptually different from the total production numbers that uh, more uh, customarily focused on. Do you have any early results on how contagious disasters are worldwide, how macroeconomic problems spread rather than being isolated? Is there any evidence of that changing over time? Well, the main cases we're looking at are ones that are international crises. So some of those are war-related, and then the uh, international connection is pretty obvious, although the size of the contractions vary a lot. Uh, some countries are much more affected, say, by World War II than others. That's obvious in terms of uh, death rates and physical destruction. Uh, other events are more of a financial nature uh, and maybe more related to some of the current threatening events in the world uh, uh, they're more like the Great Depression, uh, which is not just a U.S. phenomenon, but pretty much a worldwide one. But uh, the underlying source is something about the financial sector, and then there tends to be contagion across countries in terms of the asset markets and how they uh, respond. Uh, the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s is an example of that, uh, but it didn't affect so much the uh, most developed countries, although it certainly did seemed to be involve Russia, at least in uh, 1998. And then another earlier example in the 1980s was the Latin American debt crisis, which is another financial-related uh, event. Uh, so you haven't seen these kinds of events in the most developed countries uh, for some time. There was the 1987 global stock market crash, but it didn't seem to have much in the way of macroeconomic uh, consequence. What do you attribute the last, let's say, 50 years of stability then in the developed countries to? What's the, I always thought it was the brilliant teaching of macroeconomists, but there are probably other theories. Um, <laughs> I say that with a little, only a little bit of tongue in cheek, but maybe we'll come back to that. What do you think it is? Why, why have we done, the business cycle seems to be smoother. Why is, is that true and Why? does seem to be uh, smoother, particularly in the last two to three decades. Uh, I certainly have thought that monetary policy has improved. Uh, central banks have become better at doing the business that they're supposed to be doing, and uh, a lot of that is something like price stability and, uh, first of all, committing to that, and secondly, doing better in terms of knowing uh, how to achieve that uh, kind of outcome. But a lot of it has to be luck, uh, particularly when you're talking about events that are rare, uh, kind of a probability, if you think about it, is something like 2% per year of getting into some major uh, economic difficulty. And that means that, on average, you're going to see these kinds of events twice a century uh, for a single country. Uh, they're not really independent across countries for the reasons I've already described, but that's about the incidence. So if you think of something that usually only occurs once every 50 years, and then you're looking at a period of about 50 years since the end of World War II, a little more, and the fact that you haven't seen a, a big one uh, like that in the United States and the other major uh, uh, economically advanced countries, uh, some of that just could be good fortune. Uh, so I wouldn't rule it out as a possibility that you'll see some of these difficulties. You know, Some of this, of course, in terms of history, l relates to wartime. So you have to ask, what is the chance of having a kind of war that was uh, something like the world wars? And part of it has to do with how good are we at avoiding and dealing with financial crises, uh, something like the Great Depression of the 1930s. So those are two different types of questions as to whether you think there have really been changes. Uh, so let's move, away, let's move away from the war question. Let's focus on the financial question. A lot of people would argue that the, uh, although the Fed has done a better job over the last 25 years, the current situation that we're in is people attribute it to mismanagement of the money supply, uh, mismanagement of the rules of the game, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts there? And, and again, let, moving away from wars, the, the one in 50 chance, do you think the right perspective on this is to think of it as just a bad draw out of the urn versus a 
some sort of um, animal spirits on the part of investors that coalesce or mismanagement of economic policy? Current situation, I think, is pretty scary. Um, of course, scary can mean that instead of a 2% probability per year of something terrible, maybe it went up to 5% or 10%. So that probably means it's not going to end up being really terrible. Uh, but that's a big change. Uh, 5 or 10% is much higher than 2% yes, it is. probability. But I think the current environment, I think there's really two different dimensions to it. Uh, one is more on the financial side and relate somewhat to the housing uh, sector and related kind of mortgage finance. And you could certainly blame government policy for some aspects of that, particularly encouraging too much risk taking. Um, I don't know that the central bank is the main player there. Uh, the US government did a lot to encourage the expansion of the residential mortgage market, for example, uh, encouraging banks to lend more money, for example, to poor people, uh, which is very nice in terms of expanding uh, availability of housing and having the American dream for poorer people, but it has uh, adverse consequences in terms of the riskiness. And more problematically, these risks are, are really correlated. And I, I think a lot of the problems in the financial markets is it was underappreciated the extent to which the risks were really general or systemic rather than uh, sort of independent across uh, outcomes from different uh, investments. Well, what do you mean by that? So let, let, me, let me ask the question in a different way. I hear that claim, and I, I don't, to be honest, I don't understand it. So let, let's take one small piece of this uh, connected puzzle, which is uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, two agencies I really... I'll confess I don't really exactly know what they're about. They have something to do with encouraging home ownership and making it easier to borrow money. Uh, supposedly, they are, quote, too big to fail. But let's say they did fail. Um, let's say that the people who had invested in those agencies, these pseudo-private, pseudo-public, they're sort of, they're, as far as I understand, they're private agencies with with some government promises that unfortunately may now be about to be called on. So you're an investor in one of those, and you took some risk, and let's say you lose. Uh, it goes bankrupt. So you lose your money. And it means it's going to be harder to borrow money to buy a house. What? Why is that a dangerous thing? I understand it'd be bad for the people involved. Somebody who would have been able to borrow money now won't be able to, perhaps, some people. Uh, some people made an investment will now lose their investment. But the implication is there's going to be a cascading set of bad things happening. And that's what I'd like to better understand. I don't understand that. I say that without, you know, without irony. I don't understand it. Why is that worrisome? Or some other related think, uh, aspect of the housing market that you hear about. Anyway, just take another example. Housing prices are, are falling. That's considered to be a scary thing. Oh, I own a house. I, I, do you own a house? I, yeah, for me, I wish my house was worth more than, than less, but I'm buying a house. It's good that house prices are falling. Where's the externality or the the domino that's going to it's that's going to keep hitting? That's going to cause problems. What's the worry? If I go back to the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, examples you started with, uh, I don't think anybody's saying they're greatly concerned about uh, particularly the stockholders of those institutions. Uh, losing in terms of their equity. Uh, people can be concerned in the sense of not wanting people to suffer. It's a political but, issue there, but that's but not the But there's no issue there really about uh, bailing out the stockholders. Right. And of course the stock prices have already fallen dramatically for those. Uh, so, that, so I think that's not really the issue where we're talking about. Uh, what the government backing is, is on the other side. It's really about uh, what's going on with respect to the, to the mortgage market. Um, I mean, the government has been, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, lower-valued uh, mortgages, has been the primary player in that market uh, through the operations of these uh, two entities uh, in particular. And economists have said for many years that this looked like a bad idea, and uh, not only a subsidy element and encouraging too much uh, issue of these kinds of uh, securities, um, 
it's making the market uh, run in an inefficient uh, manner and probably resulting in, in too much investment in, in housing and uh, et cetera, the usual kinds of things that, that, that economists talk about. So I think there have been proposals uh, really over 20 to 30 years about lessening the extent of the government involvement here. And I'm sure it would be a good idea to, to break these things up into much smaller entities and have the government guarantees be eliminated. But the problem is that this whole financial sector uh, could suffer a great deal of difficulty all at once if the government is just uh, sort of pulling out and saying that I'm not going to stand behind these uh, uh, obligations that these uh, pseudo-government entities uh, have assumed. And of course, what people always go back to is something that looks like the Great Depression with financial markets basically uh, not operating. And I think that's the concern that people have at the moment with these uh, particular entities. It was quite clear ex ante uh, what shouldn't have happened. And I think the more difficult question right now is what to do with these uh, institutions because they're, they're so large and they're, they're really the dominant uh, players uh, in, in the market. And it's probably right that these mortgage markets at the moment would, would pretty much stop functioning if it, if it looked like these entities were just completely out of business. So I think it is actually reasonable to be concerned with that, with that kind of uh, event from the standpoint of the government. Well, let's go back to, let's talk about the Great Depression. And one of my worries is that the current head of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, current chair, is a student of the Great Depression. It would be awkward if a student of the Great Depression had a depression occur on his watch. So I think he's uh, particularly uh, eager to avoid an economic downturn that might, everyone would like to avoid a serious economic downturn, but I assume he's particularly eager to avoid it um, reputationally. So when we go back to the Great Depression, this sort of spiraling of financial markets out of control, we had, we had a loss of confidence, right? We had some runs on banks and then a, a sudden contraction of the money supply. Uh, as you say, to say it simply, you've got financial markets, quote, weren't working. And the Fed at the time didn't know what to do and actually contracted farther or further, I don't know what the right word is, at a time when it probably should have been expanding, right? So the, is, the, is the worry here that in today's world, despite the uh, better understanding we have of financial markets, that we could find ourselves in a situation where, uh, quote, financial markets wouldn't be functioning because of the non-existence of something like a Freddie Mac? Are we talking about a larger Freddie Mac? Are we talking about a large, or are we talking about a larger loss of confidence in the ability of people to keep their promises? Is that what it really com comes down to? Well, going back to Bernanke, I, as you say, he did a lot of his research related to the depression and particularly the role of credit markets uh, as a part of that uh, contraction. So that concern, I think, is the only way to understand the radical actions that the Federal Reserve has already uh, been taking to try to uh, fend off this kind of financial problem. Uh, and that peaked some time ago with respect to the Bear Stearns uh, situation and the takeover of that by J.P. Morgan Chase. So it's a concern. The Fed has sort of used up a lot of its <laughs> yes. uh, natural ability yeah. to acquire funny-looking paper. It did a lot of that with respect to these previous actions. Uh, so that's something of a concern in terms of what their potential is for absorbing more of this. Of course, they can always just start printing money, but that wasn't thought to be uh, the basic idea of what the policy uh, was supposed to be. So I think uh, to read what the Fed has been doing, you have to look at the fact that they have this concern that at least there's a, a higher probability than normal of a kind of financial disaster of the Great Depression type. A meltdown. Uh, yeah, basically a meltdown. But I, I wanted to say, uh, I had started to say earlier that I thought there were two dimensions of this current crisis which make it more than the usual concern. So one is what we've been talking about in terms of the financial aspects and particularly the housing mortgage market as, as part of that. But, but the second thing that's, uh, I guess, equally uh, at least of concern is about commodity prices, uh, of which people focus on oil prices, but it's only one dimension because 
most raw materials prices are up by a factor of something like three in the last three years, and oil is only one of those, and there's nothing actually special about it. If you look at all the metals and the grains and such, you find similar patterns. So if you look at it from the standpoint of production, this means that some major input has all of a sudden increased in relative price terms by a, a dramatic amount. And these are things which, in the main, the United States is not really a, a major producer of, at least not on net, in terms of its uh, use versus production of things. That, that varies depending on which well, corn. kind of raw material you're talking about. Corn, we, we're a big producer. We produce more in terms of grains, and we, we also have a lot of coal. Uh, of course, we've been burning up a lot of the grains recently from this brilliant ethanol policy, but right. that, that's probably not the best thing that the president ever did on his watch. But in any case, if you look at the world as a whole, the fact that these raw material prices that they have, have advanced by a factor of three or so uh, compared to other prices, this is in terms of relative prices, uh, this is a major concern, not only because you would think this would be a hindrance in terms of production, but it's also a concern because it's not clear why this has happened. It's not clear really what is behind this uh, event. And I don't claim to understand it, which to me adds to my concern about <laughs> what's going on here. Yeah, I understand. I mean, there are stories that seem relevant, like the uh, great economic development in China and India, for example. And those go in the right direction, but it's not something that happened two or three years ago. They've been growing rapidly, uh, China since uh, 1979 or so, and India since at least the early 90s and maybe a little earlier. So in terms of the timing, it's hard to understand why those economic developments are behind this event. So I'm totally puzzled about this uh, great advance of uh, raw material prices. Uh, and I say oil prices get the bulk of the attention, but it's not the whole story. And this has to be a major economic hindrance in terms of economic activity in the United States, but also uh, elsewhere. Well, I, I want to come back to that, but I want to ask you a question about macroeconomics generally. I was talking to a macroeconomist the other day who explained to me that um, the reason that these rapid and large increases in the price of crude oil and gasoline had not caused a recession so far, unlike the recession of the 70s that was supposedly caused by the spike in prices at that time, was that our economy is more diversified and a hundred different reasons. Um, sort of what I think of as uh, ex post storytelling, uh, which macroeconomics, of course, has, is prone to, as are many other parts of economics. And many sciences and social sciences, of course, have this problem of ex post storytelling. Ex ante storytelling, though, is really what we want to get good at. And I think if you'd asked most... <laughs> macroeconomists uh, a year ago that there was, if you had said to them, there's going to be a 33% increase in the price of gasoline in real terms, something like that, right? What's the effect on the economy? They said, well, there's going to be a recession, of course, because that kind of, in just because, you know, in the 70s, they said, well, of course, it, it caused inflation and a recession because, you know, oil's in everything. Uh, and so, therefore, it's going to cause uh, prices to go up and it'll cause a recession. And yet, until recently, Price level has been very stable in the United States. Macroeconomic output growing slower than it had been before, but still, still growing. We haven't had a literal recession yet uh, in recent in in the last year or two, despite c constant talk about it and concern about it. What do you think the the reason for that is? Why is it? I understand the first level of, of ignorance that we all have. I think we all have it as to why this these increases in commodity prices have been so large. But then the fact that they've had so little apparent impact is also surprising, isn't it? It is, but I think it relates to this question about what's the source of this change. Good point. And that might have something to do with uh, interpreting why it's had maybe lesser impact than you would have uh, thought. If you go back to the oil price increases in the 70s and early 80s, it seemed pretty clear at the time that these were supply disruptions. And then the relative price increases that are caused by that, it's not surprising that that's going to have a big negative effect on the users of this form of energy, uh, including particularly the United States, but also most other advanced countries. So if it were the case today that the big increases in the uh, prices of raw materials, uh, not only oil, but also copper and uh, 
iron and steel related to iron and other things. If most of that was a reflection of uh, strong economic growth in the world, uh, big increases in demand, then it wouldn't be too surprising that you're not seeing a recession because Correct. you'd get the higher relative prices, but as a consequence of the big demand increase. And of course, the prices going up would temper the increase in the quantities, but it, on net, you'd still see more stuff and more production. So if I thought that the uh, increases we saw in oil prices were really mostly a demand phenomenon, then I wouldn't be too surprised that I wasn't seeing a recession, at least in many economies. Uh, the ones where the demand increases were the underlying source of the, pro uh, of, of the changes. But this gets back to this issue about my not being so good at understanding why I saw you're having these big relative price increases. Uh, of course, so you have some stories about supply disruptions uh, occasionally. Uh, you talk about particular countries like uh, what's going on in Iraq or something in Nigeria or something like that. But it doesn't look like the kind of overall supply disruption that we saw in the, uh, with OPEC in the 70s and early 80s. Right. So it may be that some of it is coming more from the demand side. Uh, it, now, it is true if you look at the standard recession gauges, in the U.S., uh, if we're in a recession, it's sort of marginal. In terms of the standard numbers, it doesn't uh, look like we've actually crossed the threshold of what we usually designate as a recession. But certain particular sectors look uh, very troublesome, particularly financial, housing-related things. And now sectors that are heavily uh, oil-using, like airlines and uh, automobiles and, uh, and such, um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we will cross the threshold of what we designate as a recession, but as of yet, we haven't really done it. So then we're not even getting into the ground of how big the recession is because we haven't even gotten beyond the usual uh, margin. But if you're asking in terms of the probability of something really bad happening, I think this is much worse than, than normal. And you do see that in certain financial prices. Uh, so I'll give you one indicator of that. Uh, one thing you expect when things are really bad is that the demand for safe stuff is going to go up, uh, so-called safe haven. So you would expect to see the returns that are paid on the safe stuff go way down. And you do see that, actually, if you look at the yields on uh, treasury securities, particularly uh, inflation index treasury bonds. It's sort of the ultimate uh, safe haven in some regards. It's like, as long as you don't think the U.S. government is going to do anything terrible. Um, so the real returns on those are, are close to zero. They're actually negative at some maturities. Um, that's something of an indicator of uh, a perception of a, a really threatening environment, uh, really bad events occurring. Uh, this may also be related to things like the commodity prices, uh, whether it's related to exchange rates is a further uh, source of confusion. Because if, if you buy this argument that something really threatening is going on in the world, I'm not sure why that should be per se worse for the United States than, for example, Western Europe. So why the euro has appreciated over the last few years so much relative to the dollar, I'm not sure whether that's part of this story. It's not obvious. Yeah, but isn't that, along with the um, Treasury story, consistent with a concern putting aside everything else that inflation is going to take a, a, a major leap in the United States and make uh, the inflation aspect of those treasuries more attractive and make the dollar less attractive relative to the euro. So forget the real side, just a monetary concern. Well, with the securities that are traded now in the U.S., you can get a pretty good direct reading on what the financial markets think about future inflation. So you can do that by comparing the sort of standard nominal treasury securities of different, uh, different maturities uh, with the corresponding indexed ones. Um, so for example, you can look at 10-year uh, conventional U.S. treasuries and 10-year indexed U.S. treasuries and look at the difference in the returns there. That's a pretty direct reading of the expected inflation over that horizon, 10 years in this case. That's gone up a little bit. It's gone up by about half a percentage point uh, in the last months, but it hasn't gone up a lot. Uh, it's gone up enough to be some concern for the Federal Reserve, where it is true that uh, there's more concern with inflation than there was certainly a year ago, and they're more tempted now to raise interest rates to try to deal with that. 
but it's not yet a major uh, d uh, disaster. So people look at indirect things like gold prices and other commodity prices to try to get a reading on inflation. But I think this one uh, from the bond market is much more direct and accurate. So I'm not sure we get any additional information from the so th other things. So the returns on both unindexed and indexed treasuries have gone down, showing a concern about higher rate of risk in non-treasury assets. Is that correct? Yeah, it depends some on, on the maturity that you're looking at, but basically that's, that's true. Uh, the spread has gone up some, which supports your uh, view that expected inflation has uh, increased. So instead of being 1.5% to 2%, depending on the horizon, uh, it's more like 2.5% or a little bit more than that, but Still it's not. certainly less than 3%. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to the commodities because it's so interesting. I, Two puzzles that I don't understand. Well, one I don't understand, and the other is I just want to hear your opinion of. The, the one I don't understand is I hear a political science scientist told me uh, a week or so ago that, well, of course um, uh, Obama's going to win because the average American is, is, so, is so depressed about the state of the economy. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, look at gas prices. And I said, well... And gasoline prices, they're up dramatically, and that's very hard on people who use gasoline disproportionately at a, at a higher rate. Commuters, um, people, truckers, airlines, as you talked about, and they're scrambling to do creative things to keep those the costs down and the, the prices down from the, the impact of that. But the overall price level is pretty, pretty quiet. Um, and when I look at prices, you know, really not a good idea to look at one price. You kind of want to look at the basket. So yes, gasoline prices are up, and that's hard on, on some people disproportionately, but there must be lots of other things that aren't up nearly as much or down, because the overall index of prices is pretty pretty stable. Some, again, worry that there's a, you know increase in, in uh, especially in the last report of the CPI or the, or the producer price index. But it's striking to me when you talk about these commodity prices going up worldwide, Three and four times. There's not inflation of four and five, three and four hundred and five hundred percent. So there's other things going on that are good news. that are either offsetting that, or am I missing something here? Yeah, the only raw materials we're talking. Inflation is basically a relative price increase uh, in the main. Inflation has gone up recently in the world. So if you're talking about Asian countries, including China. They are more worried now about inflation. So you're talking about 8% inflation roughly now in, in China, whereas it had been much lower. And I think India is roughly similar now. It is true that inflation rates have gone up a lot in uh, Asian countries. And it's not something that they're uh, sort of happy with. And it, and it also relates to what's going on with their exchange rates, that perhaps they're not appreciating fast enough. But as you say, in the U.S. and also uh, Europe, inflation rates, even though they've ticked up, are not really high in historical context. So it's mostly a relative price phenomenon in terms of the increase in gasoline and uh, iron ore and whatever. Uh, uh, that's true. But if you're asking me what do people think or feel about the economy overall in the United States? I wasn't asking I that, but think, go ahead. Tell me anyway. I do think it's a big <laughs> negative. I don't I think agree. people are real happy about the economy. I agree. And I think it tends to be true that the incumbents uh, suffer from that in terms of elections, and I think that um, the Republicans are not going to do well in the election <laughs> in November. However, I think McCain is actually going to win. I think the one thing that's going to be different in the election is that the presidential result, I think, is going to be different from the congressional results, but I'm not claiming to be using a well, lot of economic expertise to, to uh, reach this conclusion. I'm tempted to say we're taping this in December of 2008, but I can actually say, and I wish I could hold up a newspaper here on the podcast, um, today's paper, but that really wouldn't work either. But it's it's actually July uh, of 2008, and we are well in advance of the election. So you, you've gone on record now with the prediction. It definitely goes against both the current polls and the uh, the betting market. So uh, congratulations. But I think, I think people are worried about the economy, and I think there's always an interesting question. Um, people seem to think that people worrying about the economy itself makes the economy worse, uh, that uh, consumer confidence is an important indicator of uh, of the future health of the economy. Is there anything to that? 
I don't know of evidence that consumer confidence is an important separate determinant, uh, sort of holding fixed what's really going on. Is there some separate influence from consumer confidence? Of course, the confidence indicator itself reflects what's going on, and the question is whether there's some uh, separate uh, dynamic from that. I know there's been research on that, and I think it's not been very persuasive that this is an important separate influence. Yeah, I've always think of it as an effect rather than a cause. Um, although I'm not surprised that the average American thinks, I mean, I think the average American, I think a poll recently said the average American thinks we are in a recession, which are, I, doesn't surprise me at all given how much we read about how we are, whether we are or not. Uh, while we're looking at um, uh, fallacies, uh, do you want to say anything about this theory that oil prices are high and other commodity prices are high because of speculation, which is a commonly believed uh, recent podcast with Doug Rivers, I think he said that 60% of the respondents to his uh, economist YouGov poll, 60% of Americans when surveyed blamed high oil prices on speculators. Um, is it possible? So there's a funny inconsistency that comes up there. I mean, the whole idea of speculation is you're thinking about the future. And something about what you think about the future is affecting the present, in particular in terms of prices. But then people who say that often say that, for example, if you change your policy so that you're going to start drilling in Alaska or in the Gulf of Mexico, that somehow that can't possibly affect the price for 30 years. Uh, Until the oil actually comes to market is the claim, which is not true. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's where the inconsistency arises. I mean, if you think speculation is important or if you think expectations are important or if you think there's some kind of ability to shift over time in terms of the existing uh, production capacity and supplies, then something you expect to happen in the future, 10 years from now, whatever, uh, is likely to have an impact today in terms of the current price, and it could be quite an important uh, effect. Um, I detect a shift in terms of the uh, kind of policies people think uh, is, is reasonable. I think there used to be a lot more support for the idea that you don't do a lot of drilling, particularly in sensitive areas. This is some, some kind of uh, pro-environmental idea was dominating over uh, the benefit of having increased supply. But uh, that trade-off changes when the price of oil triples. And I think people have uh, come to that uh, sense. So I certainly predict that whoever ends up winning a uh, presidential election or whatever, we're going to be moving more toward the side of trying to increase the supply of energy in the United States. Uh, drilling for oil is only one dimension of that, of course. Uh, various alternative energy uses could be important. Probably nuclear power is, is especially important, but also the use of coal is very uh, significant for the United States. But I think all of those uh, political policy uh, stances are, are changing, driven by this uh, reality in terms of uh, commodity prices, particularly oil prices. Well, we're taping this interview on the Stanford campus at the Hoover Institution and about a quarter of a mile from here is a gas station on campus whose prices, uh, retail prices, have fallen uh, 12 cents a gallon in the last week. Uh, so there is a possibility. I find it interesting that people just presume that, that the day, you know, the role of cheap gasoline is over forever. We'll never see inexpensive gasoline or anything like the prices we saw in the past. And of course, that could turn out to be totally wrong. And one of the reasons it could be totally wrong is we don't have any idea why they're so high, as you point out. Uh, the other event that's nearby is about uh, two miles from here, a mile and a half from here in Menlo Park. Stanford campus is very near the uh, Palo Alto-Menlo Park border. A Tesla dealership has opened. The Tesla, you and I were talking about Tesla in passing the other day, but, but uh, the Tesla dealership is a, uh, a new electric car. Uh, it's a bargain. It's only $109,000. It's a roadster. It goes very fast. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's very limited range. It, its range is 220 miles between charges, which means you can only go, since there's not a lot of charging capacity outside of, say, Menlo Park, you can only go about 110 miles. That's if you don't get lost uh, and get back to, to recharge. Uh, but there's a long waiting list. That's because they can't make very many of them. I think they're making four a month uh, to start with. And um, some very wealthy, high-profile name people have bought these electric cars. But electric cars and other things become in fashion when gasoline is expensive. And I, but we'll see how long it lasts. I don't know. Um, One interesting thing about your observation is that uh, 
I, I guess oil is the commodity that people observe most readily because they're always buying gasoline. Yeah. You know, you, you're not going to say something similar about the copper prices. Titanium. You don't have some station on the corner that's selling something that's pretty closely related to copper. Yeah. But in terms of the economic effect, it's not at all clear that the oil thing is more important. No, that's a good point. In porn. terms of the overall dimension of these commodity prices. Your, your observation is, is a striking one. Um, it, when I think of, quote, commodity prices, I think of corn and oil, because corn's been in the news a lot because of the ethanol fiasco, um, or what appears to be the ethanol. That one we appear to have, on the surface, it seems to be clear what the cause is, although on this show a couple times we've referred to the fact that since prices are usually determined by supply and demand, and since both are moving constantly with many, many factors involved to attribute a price change to one factor, especially when you talk about the other commodities that are moving also, is maybe just a bit of ex post storytelling. But I do think the ethanol uh, program has played a role in the higher price of corn. But, but you're right. You know, I think the ethanol program was a big mistake, and that that was obvious ex ante. It was also obvious that it was basically a payoff to uh, a particular interest group, uh, Archer Daniels Midland must be the best lobby organization in the world. They're doing something right. I I think. But I can't see how you can account for the increases in grain prices overall from this uh, ethanol program. First off, it's not big enough. And secondly, it shouldn't be affecting all the uh, uh, things in the same direction, although there would be some uh, cross-effects, of course. from the. the Well, the real question is, as you say, is on the quantity side, whether it's large enough. I mean, the... The ripple effect would be from the fact that people are planting a lot more corn, a lot less of other things, and that would cause those other things to get more expensive too. The question is whether the magnitudes are plausible, and those are, of course, the kind of questions that most economists would find, um, I don't know, tedious, too difficult, too practical. I mean, we, sit, we sit here in our office and talk about well, supply shifts, demand shifts. But to actually go out and look at the acreage, that would be a bit, but I assume there's one or two people who are doing that. We should, we should try to talk to them. Do you think you can explain the price of rice from the substitution across production of corn and rice and people shifting the demand patterns? And Possible. I'd be impressed if you can well, actually do that. Now that's a good question. There's, there's a lot of rice uh, grown in California, is my understanding. Probably not a lot of corn grown in California. There's probably some, but probably not very much. So it would have to be quite a bit of rippling there, probably. <laughs> this analysis has to be at the world level. It's not the U.S. No, market. That's correct. That's correct. I don't know what's going on. Uh, like you say, I, I mean, I'd be perfectly happy to say that the ethanol program was responsible for all kinds of pro- troubles <laughs> since it was such an idiotic program. But I'm no, I'm, I, I, won't, I don't want to push it. I, I'm actually pushing the alternative that, that it's too easy an explanation given the, the, the rise elsewhere but it, of other commodities. But it's an interesting question, and... They are related. The question is whether it's a plausible story. Uh, It's not enough to show that the sign is correct. You do have to show the magnitudes. Um, Let's turn in closing to something that you worked on uh, a long time ago, which I think is very relevant for what's happening today in a a different area of the economy, which is the so-called stimulus package that the president put into place with the help of Congress uh, a few months ago, sending modest uh, checks, modest relative to the size of the economy as a whole, in an attempt to stimulate the economy through a Keynesian argument uh, that somehow consumer demand would, would stimulate things. And you know, there's a lot of evidence against that. The standard argument against it is that, well, like when you ask people ex ante what they're going to do with the check, they say they're going to save it. When you ask them ex post what did they do with the check, they say they saved it. And I always find it strange that we're either supposed to spend all the time to keep the economy propped up or save a lot to keep the economy propped up. Somehow, no one seems to realize these are inconsistent uh, viewpoints. But you wrote a paper a long time ago, a very important and, and profound paper, on uh, what came to be called Ricardian equivalence. And without going into all the details of it, the way I think of it in, in this context is, uh, you know, the money for that stimulus package has to come from somewhere, it appears to have come mainly from borrowing. And surely there's a budget constraint. The government doesn't stimulate the economy from the outside. So I'm curious, do you think about that? What do you think the state of affairs is in the profession with respect to how stimulating a debt-financed um, government expansion package like this is? So as you say, basically there's no real wealth created by this kind of program. 
And since you'd expect people to be uh, expending based on their idea of their long-run wealth or income, you wouldn't anticipate there'd be much of a response from this uh, program. I think that's what you're suggesting. That's what the Ricardian uh, idea is. But, but another way to look at it is to contrast it with the 2003 uh, tax program, which is probably the best economic uh, policy that I think the Bush administration has undertaken. But the reason I think that's... Definitely, over- definitely better than, say, the steel tariffs or the, uh, <laughs> yeah, or the ethanol thing. Yeah, I'm with you there. And it was pretty good, even not in comparison. There are some good things in it. But the point is the essence of that program was that it focused on rates. Uh, it cut marginal income uh, tax rates and even accelerated the uh, rate cuts that were put in uh, to the extent that they were there in the 2001 uh, program. It also, in particular, reduced the tax rate on capital income, uh, especially with the dividend changes, but also with some others. That was, I thought, a very effective program. I thought it was uh, good in terms of long-run growth. It, uh, I think, worked well in terms of the timing. The economy was still in a recession, uh, and actually I think it, uh, it helped uh, in the short run as well as in the more important long-run uh, perspective. So the recent program is a great contrast to that. This is essentially throwing money at people by having government printed up in some manner, uh, whether it's treasury debt or uh, actual currency, doesn't make that much of a difference here. So this was a silly program. Uh, it's not going to really help in terms of the economic activity, uh, short run, certainly not long run. Uh, it's a poor program. Uh, the president didn't have a lot of political power at this point, but uh, if anything, what he should have held out for was making permanent some of the changes that came yeah. from the 2003 uh, tax cut. Uh, that was the part that might have been useful. There are a number of things that were good ideas in that 2003 package that will be lapsing. And to the extent that anything could have been done to make those things permanent, that would have been much more significant. A couple different issues there. I, I want to go back to the Ricardian equivalence wealth effect issue, which is uh, this rebate program, the so-called stimulus package, was targeted to middle and low income individuals for the receiving of the checks. People who paid f- for that tax reduction, and as you say, it was not a reduction in rates, but just really the equivalent, as far as I can see, of, of, of borrowing or printing money. People who paid for that are the future taxpayers, uh, who are different people in general. About uh, the top half of the income distribution pays about 95% of the uh, federal income tax. Top 1% pays, I think now about 22% in the latest data of, uh, uh, excuse me, pays 40%. <laughs> Top 1% pays about 40% of, of the income taxes in America, which is a stunning number. Um, so if we think about the stimulus effect of that, we've got a bunch of people who supposedly had a free lunch financed by a bunch of people who got socked for it. I think the, the claim of some people is that, well, the people who pay for it, that's in the future. They don't, they don't anticipate that, and their behavior is not going to change. But the people who have the checks in their hands are going to go out and spend it. What evidence do we have that that's not the whole story? Well, this is about evidence related to a Ricardian equivalence. But as you say, uh, Ricardian equivalence doesn't mean that individuals who are getting uh, a larger share on net of a package will respond to it. So you would expect that the people at the bottom end who uh, get checks uh, really would have more income and would be paying more because it's being transferred to them from taking it away from the general taxpayer. And as you say, the general taxpayer is certainly people in the top half of the distribution or, or really uh, more toward the, the upper end. Um, you know, we've studied the effects to some degree uh, on the effect of tax changes and uh, budget deficits on economic activity, and overall it doesn't seem to be a major impact, but I wouldn't say that Which, this, which is not a major impact? Um, short-run shifting around of uh, the government borrowing and using it to have temporary tax changes. We have a number of instances of that in the past where we've carried out that kind of policy. It doesn't look like it has any major uh, aggregate economic effect, which I think was supposed to be the idea. Um, we have shifted over time toward a situation where the uh, U.S. individual income tax is something that's uh, 
paid by a minority of the population. Uh, I don't think that's a healthy environment because it tends to mean that politically uh, more than half of the people think that this is a tax that's paid by other people. But and you know, I cheated it more a little, attractive to raise it. Yeah, but I cheated a little bit because if you just look at income taxes, the bottom fifty percent, the bottom half of the uh, of households pay five percent of the of the federal income tax. So a dollar of government spending looks like it costs a nickel, which is a big think encouragement to asking for more government spending because it's close to a free lunch. But that's only the income tax. The payroll tax actually is a substantial, of course, source of revenue for the government now. And um, it's true that people are under the illusion, perhaps, that that's funding their Social Security, but it's not. It's funding the war in Iraq and food stamps and federal agricultural price supports and everything else the government does. So it's an interesting question. You know, what we're talking about here, and by the way, I should say, when we're talking about Ricardian equivalents, we're talking about the equivalence of Debt versus balanced budget finance, correct? Is that the right when we say we, what is the equivalence when we say Ricardian equivalence? That the, it it shouldn't matter taxing how taxing a dollar and uh, borrowing a dollar today basically have the same right. economic impact. So, so you're holding fixed the level of government expenditure and you're changing the way you're paying for it, either with taxation or by borrowing. So, if people are aware of those effects implicitly, at least in the data they seem to be, then you'd think they'd also be aware of the payroll tax part of it. And maybe they're not as fooled as, as to what the real price of things are. But I agree with you. The well, the payroll tax uh, generates almost as much revenue now as the individual income tax in total. Uh, payroll tax is also a brilliantly efficient system. Uh, no doubt the deadweight loss from that is much less from the individual income tax. That's because it's a flat rate tax uh, with actually a ceiling at the top so that the marginal rate at the top goes to zero uh, eventually. So from the standpoint of economic efficiency, it's quite amazing. Uh, that kind of tax and uh, value-added taxes, which are used in most countries outside the United States, are clearly the most efficient ways of generating revenue. But the danger of an efficient tax is it becomes very tempting to use it a lot and to expand the size of government when you have access to efficient taxation. It's not so clear it's a good idea to let the government have access. And that question arises a lot as to whether the U.S. should have a value-added tax like most other countries. So if you could shift out of the individual income tax and to a value-added tax and hold the total fixed, that would be a good idea. But politically, that's probably not the uh, choice. Yeah, holding the total fixed is not the best thing. It's not the easiest thing for the government to do. But in terms of the uh, poor people and what they pay in terms of, of taxes, uh, you know, we were looking at an exercise where we were cutting the uh, individual income tax uh, or, or giving people revenue and then supporting that, I guess, with a change in individual income taxes. I thought that's what we were, what we were talking about. Yeah, so we were. In terms of who that was going to fall on. Uh, my recollection of the numbers is that not even 5% was generated by the uh, people in the bottom half in terms of the individual income tax, but I'll have to go back and I think it's about five. look at, the, I think it's about uh, five. at those numbers further. Um. Yeah, the Social Security tax is a little tricky. I mean, in terms of the, what you think about the incidence of that program, uh, poor people do pay a lot in terms of uh, payroll taxes. Uh, if you link that to Social Security benefits, uh, that tends to be a progressive uh, system uh, in the main. So the overall impact of that program, if you want to tie together the payroll tax along with the benefits, it's, it's not. I don't think you'd say that that was a regressive program overall. Uh, but then you're also saying that you don't particularly want to tie the benefits to that form of taxation, that uh, you want to tie the Iraq war along with the payroll tax, and then, of course, it's a different package. Yeah, and I think that's an illusion. I, I think, And I think it's maybe, I don't know whether it's deliberate or not, but it's certainly convenient that the payroll tax, I think people don't feel the bite of it quite so much because they think, incorrectly, that it's either being set aside for themselves personally in an account or it's somehow funding their, their parents' Social Security checks. But it's not. It's Well, it is true individually that uh, you do get more in terms of the law, in terms of benefits, the more you put in. And at the low end, at that the return, current level. In terms of the current law, <laughs> the return is actually pretty good at the low end, and Correct. then it's just diminishing. And eventually, as you get to uh, middle class and upper income, then the return gets worse and worse. 
But it is true that there's an individual return from putting more into the Social Security system. Uh, if you think the same law is going to be in effect 30 yeah. years from now or whatever, that's another question. Most people I talk to under the age of 30 think there'll be zero for them. I think they're a little overly pessimistic. I'm sympathetic with their concern, but um, just, just in closing, you mentioned that the 2003 tax package was, was, was quote, good economics, it lowered marginal rates, and increased the incentives for capital accumulation. The incentives for capital, capital accumulation, I certainly agree with. The, the reduction in marginal rates, do we have any evidence that that's an important determinant of, of economic activity in affecting economic activity? And then in, the second question is, and this will be our last one, closing thought, does not the re, wouldn't the, re, the impending repeal of those provisions have some macroeconomic impacts Potentially that really anybody talking about that. If you thought you're going to get a right, they they expire in what 2010, 11. It depends on which provision. I think the estate tax dates. is going to go back into full force in in 2010. So we're going to go from a zero rate to a substantial rate. You think that would have some impact? Any thoughts on that? This is like what happened when uh, Reagan put in the phased in tax cut in the early 1980s. And the same thing happened in 2001 with the Bush tax cuts. Uh, these were cuts in marginal rates, along with the promises that in the future the rates would be cut even more. And that implies a certain kind of uh, paradoxically uh, contractionary effect, because you know, at least if you believe what the uh, program says, that the rates will be lower in the future than they are today. And some people think that if you go back to 1981, where we had a substantial recession, 81, 82, that that effect was actually compounded by the fiscal change, which was a tax cut. Because people were waiting for the better rates? Well, that's the th well, if you think that there's any supply-side incentive type effect, it makes sense that the incentives come not just from the current rates, but from what do you think the comparison is between the current and the future rates. Sure. So the expectation, reasonably enough, in 81 was that future tax rates would be lower than they are currently. The same thing was true in 2001 because, again, it was a phased-in cut. And it is true that the recession sort of lingered on into 2002 and such. And this fiscal uh, so-called stimulus thing actually had the uh, perverse incentive effects. And 2003 was completely different from that because it uh, not only put in some new cuts, but it also accelerated the ones that had been put in and it got rid of this effect where you would be expecting the future uh, cuts uh, rates to be even lower. Uh, so you're saying the same thing today and I think it's quite right. Uh, looking into the future, it makes sense to think that the tax rates will be higher than they are currently. So that should make things more stimulative than you would think otherwise in regard to the current uh, environment. But as you get closer and closer to those um the date when things are going to go back to the way they were before, that's going to discourage people from, I would think, taking risks and in, in investing in... Long-term investing could be yeah. discouraged because part of the fruits of that will be taxed at yeah. the higher future rates. Yeah. Depends on what kind of decision one's talking about. Yeah. Uh, you'd be motivated to work more today uh, and plan to work less in the future when you think the rates are going to be higher. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's some combination of a package there. Yeah. My guest today has been Robert Barrow of Stanford University's Hoover Institution and Harvard University. Robert, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.